democracy is hypocrisy. Right. If democracy means freedom, why aren't our people free? Right. If democracy means justice, why don't we have justice? Right. If democracy means equality, why don't we have equality? Right. We're willing to be beaten for democracy. Yeah. And you must use democracy in the street. You beat people bloody in order that they will not have the privilege to vote. You can turn your back on me, but you cannot turn your back upon the idea of justice. Government of the people by the people means majority rule. But democratic majorities can sometimes be cruelly wrong. The most dramatic struggle waged in my lifetime was by a minority, American blacks. They put their lives on the line against a menace that has been used as an argument against democracy since the time of Socrates. The tyranny of the majority. I'm on my way, I'm on my way. that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. So I have a dream. My poor little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin but by the content of their character. I have a dream we will be able to speed up that day when all of our children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Martin Luther King was not the only one to die for that dream. But their lives showed that a majority can change, can learn that the oppression of minorities weakens the democracy. And that was a lesson that would soon be learned again in another country half a world away. It's September 1982, and the 12th Commonwealth Games are about to begin in Brisbane. As part of the opening ceremonies, a group of Australian Aborigines performs a traditional dance. Until just a few years ago, this is how most white Australians like to perceive their native people. Picturesque, quaint, non-threatened. Calm down, sit down, sit down. Outside, another larger group of Aborigines has gathered. They're from all over Australia, and they're singing a different song. The American Civil Rights Movement had sent a message to minorities in democracies everywhere, and they discovered how sensitive governments can be to public pressure, particularly when the rest of the world is paying attention. White people came here, and they took the land from Aboriginal people only 200 years ago, which is a drop in the ocean. We've been here 40,000 years, our people, and yet we've got to argue with them about who owned this country in the first place. Which is, a, which is a joke. Whites can't live here and pretend that they're a nation for as long as they deny us our land. They can't keep pretending that all the brutality and the dispossession stopped 200 years ago. They can't continue with that myth. They can't call this a nation until they stop stealing from us. The land had been stolen without ceremony or regret. No treaties were ever signed with the hunters and gatherers who walked this continent. About 200 years ago, the first white colonizers declared that land to be terra nullius, which means nobody's using it. Pope John Paul II would later say that was a legal fiction, and it was a convenient one because it allowed the Europeans to treat the aborigines, who had been walking this land for perhaps 30,000 years, as if they had no rights whatsoever. But now, as Australia enters its third century, its people are painfully beginning to come to terms with the contradictions of such an idea in the age of modern democracy. There are few countries on this earth more blessed than Australia, a place where the sun always seems to be shining and where the pursuit of happiness is relentless. 
It's been called the lucky country, and that's how most white Australians regard it. An egalitarian society arrived at without dogma or declaration. And yet, few modern democracies had more unlikely beginnings. Australia started 200 years ago as a penal colony. With the loss of America, Britain needed somewhere else to dump her flotsam, and Australia was ideal. An unexplored continent on the edge of the world was to become a vast open-air prison. The symbol of government on this fatal shore was the lash, and it was used on men, women, and children. Power came from the barrel of a gun, and the collective folk memory of that time has given Australians a distaste for authority that persists. Those who seek too much power are known as tall poppies, and tall poppies must be cut down. Sydney novelist Thomas Keneally finds this part of the Australian character fascinating. I would think that anyone who tried to be a demagogue in Australia would find the going tough, because Australians mistrust demagogues and mistrust uh, this grandiloquence, eloquence, political, grand political statements, manifestos. They hate manifestos. They they smell rats in manifestos, and they're probably right. I mean, this is their their good, rough, uh, fraternal cynicism, which is one of the, both one of the greatest limitations on the development of Australia and one of the greatest guarantees of Australian democracy there is. See, the trouble with democracy is democracy basically says that 99 half-wits make a better decision than one person who knows the facts. Politicians are like, are like um, wives and sheepdogs. You keep kicking them out till you get a good one. <laughs> Hatred of arbitrary rule and fear of the echoing primeval bush made Australian men turn to one another for support. They call it mateship, and it defined their society. This enormous, enormously important Australian ethic of absolute loyalty to your mate grew out of convictism, was reinforced by the nature of Australia. Two groups dealt out, one women, two Aboriginal. We were very paternalistic to them. We felt that the vote would mean nothing. Even at the time of federation, when the constitution was drawn up and, and promulgated in 1901, it was taken for granted quite blithely that they were a dying race. You know, we've been uh, at the bottom of the heap in this country ever since white people came here, and it, it, it's gone on too long, and it's taken too long. You know, the British democratic system is, is okay, providing you've got a good education, you come from a good family, and you've got money in your pocket. Uh, and that's when everything's fair and equal. Charlie Perkins, angry and opinionated, represents the new Aborigine who emerged in the 1960s. He was born on a dry riverbed and raised on a mission station near Alice Springs in Central Australia. He should have succumbed like so many others, but he didn't. He became the first Aborigine to graduate from a university. And when the black civil rights movement consumed the United States with marches and sit-ins and freedom rides, Charlie Perkins and other Aborigines were watching and listening. The first thing they would emulate was the freedom ride. Well, we, we got in a bus in about 1964, a, a group of university students, including myself and one other Aboriginal person, and we just went from town to town in no plan sort of way, and wherever we saw there was discrimination or prejudice anywhere, where we knew about it from the local Aboriginal people, we just got placards out and we demonstrated in the street, and we went from town to town, swimming pools, hotels, clubs, cinemas, restaurants, we're all barge Aboriginal people. It was a watershed. For 200 years, a tiny, bewildered minority had just taken it, not knowing what else to do. Now they were fighting back, and it was the whites' turn to be bewildered. We can't help it sometimes. We have a feeling toward white people which verges on hatred, bitterness. White people are very hard to live with. You know, they, they fluctuate between the good and the bad very easily. 
is sometimes very good, but then it's other times very bad, just about at the same time. Very complex people, not easy going at all, a bit greedy too. That's the view of themselves that white Australians didn't like to hear. It made them uneasy. At the United Nations, Australia could scold other countries for social injustice, but couldn't explain why their native people were not even citizens in their own land. And as television began to make global neighbors out of us all, I think the Australians became embarrassed that the rest of the world looked on them as narrow, racist, ungenerous. And so, in 1967, when a referendum was proposed offering the Aborigines substantial rights, it was supported by all political parties. It passed by a huge majority. It gave Aborigines the vote, equal welfare benefit, standard wages, compulsory education, and the right to drink in a bar. But it did not give them back their ancestral land. That struggle would take place in the Australian outback. A year earlier, a claim by Aboriginal stockmen for equal wages had been rejected, and so stockmen from the Gurindji tribe in Queensland went on strike, eventually moving on to their ancestral land and refusing to leave. It took them eight years, but they got their land back, and they'd forced the government to reconsider a policy of moving Aborigines from the bush and relocating them in town. Marcia Langton from Queensland was a young woman when the Gurindji made their stand. It turned her into an articulate activist for Aboriginal land rights. What the Gurindji were doing then was the most important statement that had been made about land by Aboriginal people. Because Aboriginal people everywhere were being told that the reason why they were being moved was because they were useless. And that the only way they were going to be any good to anybody is if they moved into towns and assimilated. And People were just being shoved around, and the Gurindji stood up with the help of the unions and said, this is our land and we're staying here. And so that was a real turnaround for Aboriginal people. For one group to stand up and say that meant that every Aboriginal person could stand up and say that. What did it mean to you, personally, the land claims issue? It was an idea that blossomed into many other ideas. If one group could do it, we could all do it. If it, that was their land, then my land was mine. And then not long after that, Aboriginal people from around the country decided to do something about land and went to Canberra for the tent embassy. Land now! Land right now! Land right now! Land right now! The Aboriginal tent embassy on the lawn in front of the Houses of Parliament in Canberra was an attempt to embarrass the federal government and force it to discuss Aboriginal land claims. Once again, the tactics of the black civil rights movement in America would be copied. The police acted swiftly and predictably, but the point had been made. The land issue would now be tackled by the newly elected government of Prime Minister Gough Whitlam. The simple fact is that the identity uh, and the integrity of the Aboriginal peoples in Australia, the rests on their association with the land. So we have to devise some way of vesting land in Aborigine. Its supporters called it the most progressive land legislation in the world. The dispossessed minority would be given the means of legally reclaiming what had been stolen by the powerful white majority. The Aborigines' land claims would finally be heard before special land commissions or courts. That was the breakthrough they had sought. In 1985, the first symbolic act of reconciliation took place. The most sacred Aboriginal shrine in the country is in Central Australia. Whites call it Ayers Rock after a long-forgotten state premier. Aborigines call it Uluru, which means permanent and sacred. It's a wondrous place. It symbolizes for the Aborigines their profound involvement in the natural and spiritual world. It's at the center of their most powerful myths and dreams. When you see the rock in this light at the end of the day, you can sense quite a lot of the profound significance it's had over the centuries for the Aboriginal people. But the reality is that for the last two centuries, sacred or not, 
those people had no control over their rock. It was not until 1985 that it was finally handed over to them after a bitter dispute that was resolved by a cunning compromise that made the rock still available to the rest of the people of Australia as part of a national park. Hundreds of thousands of tourists visit the rock every year. They come to take snapshots at sunset as it changes color, and in the early morning, they climb it. That offends the aborigines. They call the climbers ants. But they tolerate it as a small price to pay for getting their shrine back. They not only own it, they choose the whites who work here. People like Ranger Chip Morgan, who understands their deep spiritual relationship with the land. A very important, and perhaps the most important aspect of of land ownership is, is having a knowledge not only of the country itself, but of the songs and the dances which are pertinent to that part of the country because for every piece of country there are particular songs which are handed down from father to son and from mother to daughter. And so often at land claim hearings, ab Aboriginal people will, will, will put a great deal of importance on, on those things. And they will talk, and, but talking is only words. I mean, when they talk, people don't lie. They say, I am a traditional owner of this country. I know about this place. I walked through here when I was a child. I still walk through here today. I can tell you about this place. I can tell you about that place. I can tell you what that rock means. I can tell you how important that tree is. The Aborigines say this land was created by their mythic ancestors in what they call the dream time. But it doesn't belong to them in our sense of ownership. They belong to it. They are its guardians, its healers. They walk its dream tracks or song lines, which lead to food, water, and legend. All the tribes have their own dreaming and know their own songs, dances, and myths, proofs of ownership. This land court is in session at Lilla Creek in central Australia on a dream track that stretches for hundreds of miles to Uluru. With the help of anthropologists and interpreters, two vastly different cultures are seeking common ground. Do you know how to look at maps? Yes, I, I have seen maps, and uh, yes, I do know about them. I want to ask you some questions about your mother's dreaming, that carpet snake dreaming. Do you know where that kunia goes? At the uh, at my mother's place, the gunia pulkano, the gunias were brought brought up, were raised, and uh, then they went off in the direction that he indicated. I suppose the only point of the exercise, Your Honour, was to submit to Your Honour that when the witnesses were asked the significance of a line indicated to them without any more information, um, they gave an answer. Now, Justice in a democracy must be public and open. Aboriginal society is about secrets. Certain things should not be known by others. Sometimes the commissioners get too close to a tribal secret. Continual questioning about Wipata, a sacred place at the end of a dreaming track, make the woman translator, Marlene Cousins, fearful for her life. And all those children, you say... Can also take country at Wipata and Ayers Rock. Is that right? No, Very I nice. don't want to answer anything about Wipata. People are getting singing here. <coughs> I can hear them talking. I don't want to die yet. Me. I don't want anybody asking me questions about Wipata. I don't want to get killed, right? So explain to me why it was that you couldn't handle those questions about Wipata. Because Wipperta is a very sacred site to the Aboriginal men, and 
because the Aboriginal men are initiated into that, and that that belongs to them. You can't explain anything, especially as I was a, a woman interpreter, I couldn't explain that thing has to do with initiated men because it's very sacred to the men, and no women are allowed to listen to anything like that. And are you, were you serious that your life could be in danger if you got yes, involved? Yes, I was. Who should I ask these questions of? It's a slow and laborious process. This case may take ten years, but it's a genuine attempt by the white majority to give justice to the Aboriginal minority. From twenty years ago, when we had no rights whatsoever to speak of, um, now we have developed a land base which we couldn't possibly have imag imagined 20 years ago. Our land base through the centre of Australia, from the Pitjantjara land up to Arnhem land now, is bigger than New Zealand. The court doesn't stop at sunset. It hears evidence presented in a way the Aborigines understand best. A woman dances and sings the songs of her country. Proof positive she is its traditional owner. Encounters like this may encourage Australians to see Aboriginal society not as some atavistic culture that deserves oblivion, but as a treasure to be shared and wondered at. We are all members of tribes, and one task of democracy, I believe, is to ensure that no one tribe so dominates another that it leads to despair, and then anger, and ultimately violence. The Bogside, a battered Catholic enclave crouched under the ancient walls of Derry in Northern Ireland, once part of the old Irish kingdom of Ulster. Squatting on the ramparts are the cannons that helped defeat the Catholic army of James II. Three hundred years later, they're still pointing at the Bogside, and the symbolism isn't lost on the people who live here. It's a place disfigured by poverty, unemployment, broken hopes, a place that has nurtured a generation of children who think that democracy is a sham and who know that real authority wears a uniform and carries a gun. A place where the casual destruction of life and property is a social and political statement. Forty percent of Derry is Protestant. The majority is Catholic. Yet, by changing the electoral boundaries, the Protestants ruled here for 70 years, looking after their own in jobs, social services, and public housing. They call the city Londonderry, a name bestowed on it by the English when they began colonizing here in the 17th century. In the 1960s, a civil rights movement emerged in Northern Ireland, its tactics based on the black civil rights campaign in America. The Catholics of Ulster felt that they were treated just like the blacks in the United States, and events were to prove them right. Unprotected demonstrators were set upon by uniformed and armed men who would claim that they were upholding the law. Technically, they were right. A Special Powers Act had, for more than 60 years, allowed Ulster's rulers to set aside civil liberties at will. In 1969, the Catholics of Derry erupted. It's remembered by the people who lived there as the Battle of the Bogside. Days of continuous rioting in which the Royal Ulster Constabulary and its Protestant militia, the hated Bee Specials, did battle with the Catholics of Derry. As these images flashed around the world, the British government received an urgent message from the Irish government in Dublin. 
do something to end the violence. The Dublin government said it could no longer stand by while Catholics were being beaten and killed by Protestant security forces in the north. So Westminster made the fateful decision to send in British troops, a move opposed by Dublin, which sensed where that might lead. The troops were sent to protect Catholics from violence. They ended up beating Catholics on the streets of Derry and Belfast, sucked into a conflict they no more understood than the people who'd sent them. As I walked through the streets of Derry, watching the young, tense British soldiers playing a deadly serious war game, I reflected that it was nearly 20 years ago that Britain put troops on the streets of Northern Ireland, and they're still here, and God knows when they'll be gone. The main beneficiaries of the British decision were the men of the outlawed Irish Republican Army, the IRA. They seized the chance that history had offered. British soldiers were back on Irish soil. The old enemy had returned. The IRA see themselves as the heirs of the irregular forces who had driven the British from Southern Ireland in 1921, but who then turned their guns on each other as they fought to create a new state after 700 years of occupation. That was a short and vicious war. It ended with the Irish Free State flag flying over the Catholic South. But six counties in the north, four of them overwhelmingly Protestant, stayed British. The northern Protestants accepted the end of British rule in the south with a kind of sullen resignation. But they had kept out of a united Ireland, and they would get their own parliament, Stormont. Somebody called Stormont a democratic freak, and there was some justice to that, because from the time it was open, it really was an anomaly. A legislature in which discrimination against the Catholic minorities was institutionalized and legalized. The Protestants had a two-to-one majority in the North, but if Ireland were to be reunited, they would become a tiny minority this risk made them fearful of anyone whose loyalty to the crown was suspect. And so began a dismal chapter of discrimination against anyone even vaguely connected to the idea of one Ireland. In doing so, the Protestants unwittingly gave succor to the very faction so passionate about uniting Ireland that they were prepared to die and kill for it. The local member of parliament for the bog side is John Hume, a moderate, decent Catholic who copes with the hatred of Protestant extremists, who see him as a dangerous Republican, and the IRA, who regard him as an agent of British imperialism. Well, at the moment, we're going through a very interesting uh, experience in the development of democracy in this part of the world, because uh, look over that wall there, there's the bog side. Uh, and we have lived with injustices for, for all our lives. We have lived with unemployment that has never been less than 20%. 44% of our population are under 25, and 50% of them are out of work and don't have any hope in this sort of situation. They see, and I mean, what, what is happening is deep thinking is going on. That's the most highly politicized community sitting down there in Western Europe. It's also the most highly unemployed. Right, because, in the, in the bog side. Because of what they have been through. And the problem here isn't just about relations within Northern Ireland, Protestant capitals, the whole world seems to think. It's about relations within Ireland as well, and it's about relations between Ireland and Britain. John Hume has long been at the sharp end of Northern Ireland politics, and has been attacked and arrested for his beliefs. And it was in his constituency that one of the most dramatic protests against British policy in Northern Ireland was held. In January 1972, thousands of people gathered in Derry for a civil rights march that had been declared illegal. Suddenly, it became an event without parallel in modern British history. It became Bloody Sunday. One of the people.
people on the march that day was Nell McCafferty, a dairy writer now living in Dublin. She remembers her astonished realization that the soldiers were firing live ammunition. Two people with her fell. Both had been shot. I ran up in through the front garden of a house up the little pathway and knocked on the door. And asked the woman to let me in, and this is normal in there. They open the doors and they bring me in. And a fellow came running up the path to get into our house. And uh, I heard a shot. And he fell down in front of me outside the window. And uh, I closed the door, went back and lay down on the ground. And I heard the fellow saying, because I knew him, I knew my name. And yeah, would you have opened the door? And uh, And I didn't, of course, because I knew if I opened the door, I'd be shot dead. And I was, I was gazing at the one, but another fellow came, came running by, and he was shot. And he lay there, and I could hear the him groaning. And then the shot stopped. And uh, there was a period of silence, and I took the chance of looking out the window again, and... A red cross worker was running across the courtyard. I could see the two fellows there. And suddenly the shot started again. The soldiers made her dance. She was dancing around with the bullets, and I lay down again. And uh, I stayed in the for, for, for another few minutes, and then I could hear from the sound of voices that was all over, and I opened the door and walked out and uh, stepped over their bodies. Conflicting accounts of that day, but some facts are irrefutable. At the end of it, 13 people lay dead. Another 13 were wounded. All had been shot by British soldiers. A British inquiry failed to conclude that any of the dead or wounded had been armed. Ireland, north and south, is a place of anniversaries, memories where the two communities constantly remind one another of the events that shaped their destinies. This is August the 12th. The Protestants of Derry are about to commemorate the occasion some 300 years ago when the apprentice boys of that city closed the gates of Derry before a besieging Catholic army. Remember, this march is taking place in the heart of a predominantly Catholic city. But on any 12th of August, a visitor might be forgiven for suspecting that the majority is really Protestant. Because Protestants come here from all over the province, and from England, sometimes from Canada and America, to help celebrate in the Apprentice Boys Parade. For them, it's a day of a kind of grim rejoicing. But for the Catholics who live here in Derry, it's a fearful day, and one that more often than not ends in bloodshed. Behind the strutting bravado is genuine fear. These people, descendants of British colonists who settled centuries ago, call themselves loyalists, and they're fearful of being abandoned by Britain and forced into a republic run by Catholics. the Loyalists' day, and the Catholic youths from the bog side who've come to watch and jeer this annual ritual of Protestant supremacy are kept away from the parade. If they were not, there would be bloodshed. The leader of the Apprentice Boys is John Noble, a mild-mannered dairy storekeeper. He says he disavows violence, and yet he heads an organization that provokes it every year. What would happen if some inspired leader from the Protestant side stood up and said, all right, boys, enough of the killing, and went to the leaders of the Nationalist side and said, you and I are going to sit down, 
and talk and stop the violence and get this country together. What would That's happen the then? last thing he would say as a leader of an Irish population. He would no longer be leader of an Irish population. It's a situation in which you've got one minority that dislikes its position up against a majority that fears becoming a minority in the United Ireland. I mean, is there a legal way of resolving that problem? No, I, I can't see it. Obviously, the minority uh, population in, in, uh, in Northern Ireland at present um, want nothing to do with the United Kingdom or Great Britain. Um, we feel that as a minority population within a, a United Ireland, that we're very much under the influence of the Church of Rome, and that's something which the, we as, as Protestants are not prepared to accept. In the absence of leaders of goodwill, it's demagogues like the Reverend Ian Paisley, who many Protestants turn to. And that, I found myself thinking, is like saying there's no hope. Paisley's views on reconciliation in Ireland are depressingly simple. Mrs. Thatcher tells us that that republic must have some say in our province. We say never, never! So just how can the people marching here this day be convinced that all else having failed, they have to share power with the minority if there's ever going to be a peaceful democracy in Northern Ireland. They have up till now sought to protect their distinctiveness as a people, the, pro the integrity of the Protestant tradition in Ireland. Uh, and to protect that is an objective that I support because I believe in diversity, but their methods have been wrong. Their method has been to hold all power in their own hands. That is bound to lead the conflict. And my message to them is that if you want peace and stability, which we all want, then we have a simple choice. We live together or we live apart. Living apart has not been very, very pleasant. Living together isn't going to be very, very easy, but it's the only way forward. The whole of Ireland is involved in the struggle for democracy in Ulster. Under the 1985 Anglo-Irish Agreement, which gives Dublin a say in the affairs of the North, the security forces of the Republic have intensified their border operations against the terrorists of the IRA. Ever since that agreement, Dublin has tried to assure Protestants that they have everything to gain and little to lose from a greater association with the South. That's asking an awful lot of people who have always regarded the Republic as a backward, priest-ridden country where the Catholic Church's influence is woven into the fabric of daily life. This is, after all, a country whose very constitution, drawn up in 1937, was written with the help of the Catholic hierarchy. The Church's views on morality were given the force of law. Ireland is a democratic republic, and yet the Catholic Church remains a dominant political force. And these next few days here in this country are going to show whether or not it is the dominant political force, because Ireland is voting this week on a national issue that could change her course as a democracy, as a republic, and as a Catholic nation. What the men and women of Ireland have been asked to decide is whether divorce, which is banned by the Irish Constitution, should be allowed if a marriage has failed irretrievably for five years, and if adequate spousal and child support can be provided. Officially, the Church throughout the whole national debate has refrained from its old dictatorial posture, and yet from pulpits all across Ireland, people could still smell the hellfire. It's a fascinating test for a democracy. A majority is being asked if it really wants to impose its will on a minority. Moira Kelly of Donegal sees no moral dilemma in the choice that she'll make. Well, it doesn't really make any difference to me. But then again, why? I, w I don't need divorce for my marriage. Perhaps somebody else might think they do. But I don't think that I have the right to water down marriage to accommodate other people's situations. The man behind the referendum is Garrett Fitzgerald, leader of the Fina Gael government. 
the son of a Catholic father and a Protestant mother. He believes that reconciliation between the two Irelands can come only if the South becomes a more pluralistic society, in which the rights of non-Catholics are seen to be respected. The Protestants in the Republic, who make up less than 5% of the population, have suffered very few of the indignities inflicted upon Catholics in the North. One of the odder legacies of British rule in the South is that the Protestants have some of the best churches, including St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin, once one of the city's most important Catholic cathedrals. Democracy takes a long time. The Dean of St. Patrick's, the very Reverend Victor Griffin, sees the divorce referendum as a vital opportunity for the South to reach out to the North. I think it's very crucial because um, of the Northern situation. For example, if the referendum is lost, if there's a no vote, uh, and that's in the majority, then it's going to reinforce the old attitude in the North amongst the Protestant people that Rome rule okay. Yeah. It's definitely going to be interpreted in that light, and it's going to have an effect on all moves towards reconciliation and towards eventual reunification of the country. Clara Clark of Dublin is passionately involved in the outcome of the divorce vote. She is one of thousands of Irish women and men whose marriages have failed, who have formed new relationships and families, and yet who, together with their children, live in a legal limbo. Despite the fact that I'm living apart or over 12 years, I'm still legally married to my husband. And this is something I don't want to be. I want to be my own person. I want to be legally free. The institutional church in Ireland at the present time is the one and only single body who is investing both money and time and personnel and energy and resources to alleviate the condition and the situation of these people. It's still hard for me to understand how you, as a compassionate mm. Christian leader, mm. can feel comfortable with a state law that says to a Jew or a Muslim, mm. or to me as a mm. Protestant, you can't be divorced because we don't believe in it. I mean, aren't you at all troubled about that aspect, the dealing with <laughs> compassion with the minority? Oh, yeah, very definitely. Uh, I, I certainly am, and I think it's a test of uh, uh, one's maturity or of a country's maturity and their, uh, the strength of their democracy is in so far, how far can they go in accommodating the views of, of the minority? That is an extremely difficult uh, uh, question, and I do not have a ready answer to it. The government's divorce proposals have been decisively rejected. The results are calamitous for the referendum supporters. Only in Dublin was the vote split 50-50. Elsewhere, by a margin of two to one, Ireland rejects divorce. Did democracy work the way it's supposed to work? Well, I suppose it did, and that the people have rejected it forever, but not in, in the sense like that, to me, I think we should care for minorities, and uh, people should have a choice, give them free choice forever, and, and the result of it is just not. 94% of the people of Ireland are Christians and I don't see that we really should get overly bothered about trying to view a situation from other denominations' points of view. Northern Ireland will function without one-third of its population feeling a true part of it. And so they will question the very legitimacy of the state and what will become of the children. Ireland are 
are Christians. And I don't see that we really should get overly bothered about trying to view a situation from other denominations' points of view. Whites can't live here and pretend that they're a nation for as long as that they deny us their land. will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God.